you remember that first meeting when you and I met? <laughs> you remember that? That was, that was extraordinary. <laughs> it, it was like, we were, everybody was like, what, it was a whirlwind right through the, this small, tiny unit. <laughs> and even prison officers, everybody, who was that? <laughs> it was like, but it was, it was colossal. It was, it was a meeting that was never going to end and never will end. The energy, the energy from that still carries everybody on. It was like, wow. Now tell me, wh when you first met Boyce, did you know anything about him? <coughs> did, did Please you... understand, Richard, that art was so alien to my world. Yes, of course it would be. It was so alien to my world. Because in the bad, amongst the bad people, I was, I was the hero. Yes. So they reinforce all the negative in that world. Understand? Yeah, yeah yes. And so when I started to get involved in, uh, when I'd done that clay head, I remember reading the Scotsman newspaper and I seen this article and it was coy Coyote. And that's the first, this is the first art thing I've ever read in my life. Good God. And I, th I thought, oh, what is this? <laughs> and and it, it described me. Yeah. This man just blew me away. I thought, oh my. And I've read this article. I remember it now, and it made such a deep impact on me. But never, ever, ever could I have imagined meeting and having a dialogue or relationship with yeah. somebody. Never. It was the furthest thing from my life. Never in a million, trillion years could I, could I have a consider getting out for that one day. And now I'm talking about synchronicity here, because that's my word of the moment. You'd be in prison for 17 years. I'd been in prison all that time, and the idea of me having a day out, oh, God. I mean, was, was, it was so alien to anything I can imagine. And I was taken out by two guys, yeah. prison officers in civilian clothes, and they said, you can go through and see my work, which you were, were exhibiting in, in, yeah. in Edinburgh. And this, then we got there and we seen it, and they says, do you want to go for lunch? I says, no. I says, I've read there's something on in the poor house. Oh, and there's this guy who was in a cage with a, a coyote. And they say, but why are you doing that? Why don't you go and have a nice meal? Because you're getting prison food all the time. No, I says, I want you to go and see this. And I went in, and I'll never forget seeing that, the poor house doors. Oh, yeah. Uh, for me, it was like, oh. And it was crossing, that, at that moment, it was crossing a threshold. It was extremely important for me as a human being. I was crossing a threshold, mm -hmm. and I went into that place, and it was the most amazing, magnificent <sighs> setting. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was extraordinary. And going in there, and seeing you and seeing Joseph just about to start and Caroline, who I didn't know, and everybody sitting around. And I sat there and heard the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh. And afterwards, I thought, I'm going to introduce myself to this guy. Mm -hmm. So I walked up to him and I says, hi. I didn't even call him Joseph, it was hi. Mm -hmm. I says, I am the co coyote. <laughs> and he understood. And he looked. And Caroline and you were there and went, oh, you says, this is Jimmy Boyle. <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. Well, that was it, him it was being tested. He was being tested mm. to the very marrow of his being mm. because he had to make a decision within a tenth of a second that this was, mm -hmm. what can I say? It was a turning point in his life. Yeah. As, as well as yours. So how, do, how did it develop after that? Well, what happened is that, um, that the, you, were, you were speaking and you were trying to explain to him what our place was and yeah. you were at that point saying this is the best art gallery in the whole world and you've got to, you've got to come and see it. Yes. And he was like, what? And I says, come, please come. He says, I'm coming. God. He, he didn't speak so good English at that point. No, he didn't. Cause, because... Um, Caroline translated for him. Yeah. And he says, no, no, he's coming. She says, he'll come. And then you brought him across. Do you remember 
Bill Beach standing with a camera. Yeah, Bill Beach was there, <laughs> and um, Mike Myers, yeah, and Phil Hitchcock, yeah, and Jane Beach was also there, yeah, and it was like, and they'd they'd come. I mean, they'd come and got us to do the craziest things that I you know. could ever. I mean, it was like. They were the madmen in the asylum. We were the sane ones. I know. <laughs> and they, they, they had the prison officers hand over their white the, coats. Their uniforms, yeah. The uniforms white coats. to the prisoners. And their hats. And their hats. <laughs> and, and, and these days, uh, the camera couldn't post possibly photograph no, show, your... Show your faces, no. no. So we were, in this, we were in this sort of mad, mad situation where... where we could do the craziest of things, but we couldn't. They couldn't show our faces. Don't show their faces. That was the rule. And so we put these masks up in front of our faces, and it was, but it was, it was the maddest. You know, bearing in mind our background, yeah, and where we come from, we were sort of suddenly in this complete Alice in Wonderland sort of yeah, yeah. scenario. It was, it was the maddest, wickedest most beautifulest experience ever. Yeah. And it's hard, it's hard to explain this to people, but it, it was coming back to what I was saying earlier, it was art breaking down the walls. Yeah. It was now, can I, as that. Can I say, during this time you were writing what became the text of a great statement, A Sense of Freedom. A Sense of Freedom, yeah. yeah. And I remember uh, sending my assistant and goring in yes. with the idea that we had to get that text out. Yes. And she stuffed it under her yeah, jumper. jumper. Yeah. <laughs> and it went on to become a bestseller in a movie. Yeah. It, it was amazing. And, and But the fact is she got out with it yeah. and mm -hmm. she had this incredible relation called Stephanie Wolf Murray. Yeah. God bless her. She died recently, you know. Yes, Canagate. Uh, Canagate Press. Well, she bec they became great friends, yeah. But you see, it needed someone with that kind of attitude yeah. to publish it. Yes, Publish exactly. the work exactly. of a yeah. guy who yeah. was in prison yeah. and regarded as public enemy number, number one, one or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this book immediately became a bestseller. Yeah. Uh, now, did it, what, what was the reaction? As far as you were concerned. Well, again, you, you know, everything that you do about freedom, the authorities react. Mm. And so it created a lot of personal problems for me, mm. but I never regretted it because these were good problems as far as I was concerned. If I'm involved in violence, as I had been before, they're bad problems, and it's not good for society yeah. as a whole. Yeah. But here I was writing what was a truth and getting it out and publishing it, and you know, they hated that because they preferred you to be seen in your box. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. is is a is a, a violent person yeah. beyond redemption. Yeah. So the minute you find redemption, mm -hmm. and the minute you s express yourself in a positive yeah. way, they can't deal with it. Now tell me, what was the essence of that extraordinary? It was an expression of uh, the need for you to feel freedom. Look, let me just tell you this: that getting that book. Out with little sweet Anne taking that book out, smuggling that book out at great risk to herself. I know. It was it was like a part of me being set free because I could tell I could tell my side of the story. Up to now, it was the authorities' side of the story, and therefore it changed people's perception of me. Yeah. Greatly, I mean, it was it was incredible the impact it had. It, were you surprised when it was made into a film? Yeah, it didn't matter to me, the film, no, to be no, honest with you, Richard. I mean, the, what mattered to me was the book. The film is somebody else's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I, people say, what do you think of the movie? I was like, I would have done it differently. But yeah, you would. It, other people are doing that, but the, the book is true to me. Yeah, yeah. That's every word that you wrote. Every word that I wrote, you know, that was, that, that's me. So the rest didn't matter, and I quite clearly didn't want to benefit from the book. So I gave all the money to, I made up a trust fund for to go to all the kids who could be future Jimmy Boyles. Yeah, you knew yeah. that the, the social 
structure of society was manufacturing, m making... Making these, making these kids, Jimmy yeah, Boyles. Yeah, yeah. Th there's mm -hmm. no way they could be um, other than that. Uh, with, I mean, that was a terrifying time. Mm. And... Uh, it, it, it put the unit in very shaky ground, to be honest with you. It did. Yeah, but and that's, that, would, that, that would have been my one regret, because the special unit was such a unique oh. place, you know. I mean... The period was unique. I mean, who would have thought you'd have people like Cantor, Paul Niagu, <laughs> Joseph Boyce, everybody, Mar Marina Abramovich, yeah. all coming into this little place. No, nobody can believe it. I mean, these are the superstars. I know, um, amazing, all, all in a very short period of coming in. And you know, of course, that um, this meant I was testing them. You were. No, no, that was very obvious. I, I was saying, look, if you're an artist, then don't be satisfied with what the art world mm -hmm. offers you. Mm -hmm. It offers you the possibility of being uh, a celebrity, a, a success. But being an artist means that you're the defender of truth and beauty. Yeah, and freedom. A, a sense of freedom. And and you've got to make them relevant yeah. as artists. So, I suppose this was too much for the Arts Council to stomach a sense of freedom. Yeah. The, um, they didn't want you coming to the special unit. They and the, the, the extension of that is they don't, didn't want someday for the status of Joseph Boyce coming to the special unit. And what was happening, in a sense, is, is that art was actually breaking down the walls. We know well, that's the power of art. It but it was breaking down the walls, mm. and the authorities just couldn't cope with it. That's why the arts there was a lot of pressure on the arts council, which badly affected you. But it, but it was a, the most magical period you'd ever, ever believe because that was that was about art and art making such a powerful impact in a in, in a Calvinistic society. Yes. Yeah, they didn't understand that art was an expression of love, of, of, of respect, of uh, the defence of freedom. The integrity of art, yeah. you know, because that's what it was about, you know, it was a truth. Yeah, the truth that had to be told. It had to be told, and you couldn't escape, you know. If you, if you tried to divert that truth, you, you were moving at the, 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 the realms of Stalin, or yeah. some other totalitarian state. Yeah. And that's always the... That's always the the conflict, always the battle, and that's what Joy Joseph was about. I told him, of course, at one point, I said, you realise if you take out a court case, <laughs> it's going to go to the Secretary of State yeah. because he's responsible on behalf of the Queen. I mean, it's Her Majesty's prison we're talking yeah, about. <laughs> I said, you're going to lose. <laughs> Nobody has ever won mm. a case against... Uh, Botanic Majesties. But we eventually we eventually won because I took the, I, after Joseph done, I then um, applied to the European Court of Human Rights. Oh, well, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a record-breaking decision about freedom of expression, and oh, and, and I went to I went to uh, Brussels to the court with my Queen's Counsel, who um, was a man called Anthony Lester, and. Good God. We, we, it was amazing. And just to set the scene, I mean, I goes into the court and everybody's sitting there. It's very, very civilised. And all these four judges are up there on the bench. Can you imagine this happening in the British court? Sitting on the bench there. And I get, come in and sit at my Queen's Council and another guy at QC Junior called David Panic. And each of the judges come up, come up, moved over and come over and shook hands with me. And says thank you for coming. And it was so civilized, and, and it was like whoa. And um, they says the, the British government uh, have made a very bad decision. And so Joseph eventually won that through me taking it, lifting the baton from him, and taking it forward. What? A st what's the date of this? That yeah. is, um, I, I can't remember now, but it's nineteen. I think it was a bit. 1984-85. Goodness gracious. And so we won the case. So Joseph actually won. 
He won. Yeah. Well, I, I hope he, <laughs> he hears us. <laughs> you won, yeah, yeah. But the fact is, he had already shown his commitment to you yeah, of course. in uh, that amazing um, moment. And I, I, I took photographs of it, so I remember it so well. Uh, it was uh, about your sculpture in defence of the, the innocence. In defence of the innocence. And of course, I tried to get out to the opening to your gallery. And they wouldn't and allow they it. Said no. And so I asked Cadillac to speak to Joseph and say, would he come over <laughs> and stand in? JB stands in for JB. <laughs> JB stands for JB. <laughs> and and it, was, it was just extraordinary. So he came up to the unit first and he says, what do you want me to do? He phoned over from Germany just for that. And I say, um, just be JB. He says, but I am JB. <laughs> and he says, but I'll be there as you. And it was fabulous. Good God. I'll never forget that moment. It was one of the high points of my life. Yeah. And it was in that small gallery. Gallery, that's right. Yeah, in Mentee's house. And it was typical of um, the situation I found myself in where I realised that um, I'd lost the beautiful space in Melville Crescent uh, because yes. I had um, committed myself to the spirit of the avant-garde, the spirit of revolution, which existed all over uh, the world in the late 60s. Yes. It, was, it was flower power and it was um, uh, students in, in a state of revolution in, in mm -hmm. Paris, in, 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 right. in, 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 in uh, Los Angeles. It was, it was incredible. Putting the world. flowers in the barrels of guns. That's right, yeah. And of course, um, the Edinburgh Festival uh, didn't quite understand <laughs> That this was happening, and um, it, 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 the, the program for the festival uh, didn't really register th this mm -hmm. extraordinary s state of affairs. It was like a, a sudden, almost, how can I say, uh, shift in, in the whole uh, structure of society. Mm. And you had not long before you met Boyce uh, had endured something which was really about a complete breakdown of the social order. Mm. You found yourself in Inverness in what were the cages? Five and a half years in the cage. See, and, see, I'm speaking to you now, and I keep mm. finding it impossible to imagine the pain mm. of confinement in, that, mm. in these conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I have nothing but um, respect and admiration for those extraordinary human beings that you ended up working with. Oh, yes. The, the, how, well, what were they? They weren't prison officers. No, really. no. But what were they? <laughs> Can you name them? <laughs> They were agents of change. They were. Yeah. And they responded. Uh, I mean, the, the reason why I was asked to go to the special unit was I'd already caused trouble uh, by bringing um, the theatre company from San Quentin. That's right. Rick, Rick Clichy. Clichy. Yeah. And he'd been on death row. That's right, yeah. And, and the he reason worked with Beckett. Beckett. That's right. I was so grateful to him because it might have been a difficult play for, for normal human beings to understand. Yeah. But when he... They when, got it. <laughs> they got it. They, they got it. Yeah. There were 500 people in St. Qu San Quentin suddenly confronted with the truth of waiting for God. Yeah, they knew right. what... Uh, what it was. They, <laughs> they knew. Yeah. And, and so I took him... I met him in America... Uh, uh, I, I, I realised what I was dealing with. I was dealing with someone extremely important. Brought him here, and he performed that um, play w w with the, the people who had been on death row mm -hmm. um, in the 
uh, uh, what do you call it? Pullman's uh, uh, it's Boston institution. Boston, yeah. Uh, yeah. But these were the young people who were being slowly yeah. um, uh, educated to end it, up in Berlin. Berlin, exactly. You know, that, they, they, exactly. they were innocent. They were in training for in Berlin. Training, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I never forget uh, the guy th that was so wise to take, well, take, make a decision to say, w would you bring them? Yes, back uh, into prison. Back into prison. <laughs> Only you would do that. Well, <laughs> and, and he became the governor, the guy uh, in charge of the special unit. Yeah, yeah. What was his name again? Ken Murray. Ken Murray. He was the most remarkable man. Tell me about him, his background. Um, he came from the Isles, uh, I, up in the islands, and um, I think it was Stornoway, was it Stornoway, Ken? And he was just a ordinary guy, but he was a giant of a man. He was a huge spirit. And he'd, he'd become the head of the Prison Officers Association. But Ken was never a prison officer. He was never a prison officer. He was, he was a giant of a man. He was a huge spirit. And when he started to, he, you know, we were very bad people. Yeah. Let's not get away from that. Yeah. Very bad people. Dangerous. Where, yes. And we hated them. Yeah. And I remember um, Ken Murray, the Prison Officers Association, which is a trade union, yeah. and the prison authorities in the Scottish office said, how do we deal with these people? And it was all down to two people. The head civil servant is a man called Alex Smith. Alec, no. Not Smith. Alex, Alex. Smith. He, he was the Can't guy do. that invited me it, to to, to that's, that's right. And um, Ken Murray. Mm -hmm. So Ken Murray said, there's only one way we can deal with this. You've got to banish these cages, get these people out of these cages, because if you treat people like that, they'll act. And behave like that, like animals. Yeah, you do some of this. And so, there was five cages. There was five people. So they started to bring them down to this new concept called the special unit. And the head person in it was Ken Murray. And I rem remember I was the last one to be brought down because I was the sort of leader, and they thought that I would upset the apple cart. Yeah. So they eventually. Um, Recommended the recommendation for me going to the special unit <laughs> was the prison governor in, in um, Inverness cages. He said, "This man should never be released ever again, as I have very intimate knowledge of him, and I know that he will kill again." That was the re that was my sort of reference to go to this place, and <laughs> and, and I arrived. Oh. I arrived there with, it and I was, I was completely animalised. I've got to say it. Yeah, yes. Totally. I mean, it, just one physical manifestation of that is when I arrived, and I was asked questions because I'd been five and a half years in the cage. When I was asked questions, and if I spoke for too long, I was in complete agony by my vocal cords, oh my God. which had never been used for any lengthy conversation over five and a half years. So that was the immediate physical manifestation of that. But there was other ones in the sense that my thought process is I'd just become animalised. I could smell I could smell polish on the prison officer's sh shoes outside the, um, the cage. cage. I could smell tobacco oh. on them, even though they weren't smoking at that point. So all, all my senses had heightened but really I'd become animalised. I was like an animal in a place trying to survive, naked. Mm. And, the, um, and when they tried to give me clothes, I says, no, the punishment was, we're taking your clothes off you. So then I says to them, then I'm never gonna let these people um, punish me again. So when they says, put your clothes off on, we've got some doctor or some important visitor coming, I says, no. And, and so the, the, the essence of that was for them not to punish me. Anyway, here, that is the person I am at that point. And I come down and I 
go walk through this unit, and the f- person who meets me is Ken Murray, oh and I've got a little brown paper parcel with my belongings in it, and he sa- he said to me, "Hello, Jimmy." It's the first human <laughs> contact I've had with a human being for five and a, five and a half years, <laughs> and he says, "Sit down, sit down there," and he says. Would you like a cup of tea? And it was like, <laughs> just suddenly being let into some alien planet. And, and to make matters even worse for me, because this was, this was terrifying for me. He, he, I'd lived in a plastic world. He lifted a pair of scissors and he says, do you want to cut open your parcel? To the most dangerous man in Scotland. <laughs> so... That sums up Ken Murray. He was, he was mass. But what gets me about all of this is the synchronicity of it all. The synchronicity of him, Joyce Lang, yeah, Richard DeMarco. Yeah. I mean, it was that could only happen at that time. It couldn't happen any other time. And this, and the synchronicity of that was was quite terrifying to the authorities. Yeah, you know, and then when I started the, jo- Joyce gave me um, seven pound of clay, and I did a portrait of one of the guys. It was like a creative dam person on me, but if you think I'd not been, I'd not been communicating for five and a half years, yeah. and then suddenly, somebody gives me this clay, and I feel I can communicate with it. So I felt safer communicating with that material. Than communicating because it would be animalised, completely distrust human beings. And that's, that's the picture you walked into. Yeah. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I don't want to be in the art world that's not about the defence mm. of freedom, mm. of the freedom of the individual, the freedom that mm. uh, is built into the concept of democracy, mm. a democratic way of life. Mm. Now, what did you think of, of um, Boyce's idea of um, the, his, his, the essence of his? Um, art was what he called social sculpture. Social sculpture. W- what yeah. did you think that was? Well, I think you, you know that can easily be misinterpreted. But Joseph saying that um, he did, when he says everybody can be an artist, yeah. which I, I totally agree with. Yeah. But he meant it. He meant it in the way that how we relate to each other as people. He's not saying. The, the bus conductors are necessarily going to be a great painter, no, a great no, sculpture. No, 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 what no. he's saying is how they, how we all conduct ourselves in our daily lives. Yeah, yes. And, and you know, for example, if you look at the state of the world as we are now in 2018, you know, and 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 that's the opposite of what Joseph Boyce meant. His yeah. social sculpture was we can shape our own society through shaping ourselves and through yeah. And answer. And he, I mean, it's such an obvious truth. It is. People haven't quite understood the, his genius, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. They actually think of him in terms of some of his students, like Kiefer, Anselm Kiefer, mm, yeah. who's uh, a genius at making paintings, and he signs them, and they sell for millions of whatever. Joseph had never made an artwork like that. Joseph's art was a kind of spin-off mm. of his thought processes. Process, yes. it, it, it was an, um, a manifestation of his philosophy, mm, of his, his, mm. pre- his need to express love for another human being, yeah. especially a human mm. being who was, um, as far as he was concerned, in a situation which was intolerable. Mm. Um, he suffered great pain at the end. He, he mm. slept standing up because he couldn't endure the pain if mm. he lay down, mm. um, and the mental anguish that he knew mm. uh, after the war. Um, art, of course, the language of art saved him yes. from self-destruction, from, um, he, he could deal with the pain. He was a living embodiment of what you uh, mm. personify, mm. how the language of art is your, your, your means of, how can I say, healing. Yes, without doubt. The, the mm. wounds. Mm. 
I guess I went to the special unit with the, by the same by the same with the same instinct that I yeah, went to Eastern yeah, Europe. Yeah. Everybody thought I was bonkers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what the hell are you doing? You can't go. Why are you going to Poland and Romania uh, when you should know that they have no money and you can't? Their art, therefore, is useless. I yes, thought. exactly. And that's when real art comes and out. And you then found yourself in in a situation mm -hmm. in the poor house where Cantor was making his I know, incredible incredible statement and, and it was the most magical period I mean what is it what is the Edinburgh Festival done since then nothing well, and I, when you see those statements and there was that period was just it's mind-blowing the, the huge talents that gathered in that one two years yeah incredible but let me t tell you just another thing came, came to in relation to the whole issue of art breaking down the prison walls. Now, yeah. drugs control prisons now, and the authorities do not complain. They've got everybody subdued. They tolerate it. And look how they reacted to art. I mean, they hated it. Yeah, they when that was, And that's the difference. Yeah. That's how threatening art is, yeah. because it was waking people up, yeah. allowing them to come alive at yeah. every level. Yeah. In the period that we're talking about with Boyce, Cantor, yeah, yeah. Abramovich, yeah, yeah. You know, all, and then you look at now, where everybody's sedated with drugs That's and right. nobody, nobody cares. Yeah. And also, they're sedated by the world of entertainment. Yes. Uh, everybody is assured uh, of uh, celebrity status. I mean, Warhol said that everybody's right. going to be famous for yes, 15, 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah, and that's it. And I, I know the world has changed. I, I know that it's, it's full of people in despair. Uh, the, the problem of people committing suicide now mm -hmm. in Scotland is reaching high level. The drug um, problem has never been greater. There's a vast section of society mm -hmm. in, in, in a hopeless situation. Mm -hmm. The art world is so divorced mm. from it that it, it couldn't possibly be seen to be helpful. The, the, the world of the stand-up comic mm. uses only laughter, but Boyce never made the mistake of saying that uh, the whole business of being a human being was about unrestrained laughter. Mm. He knew that there was also the business of dealing with pain mm. and, and, and uh, the, the balance between pain and, 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 and well, tears and laughter mm. is, is at the very heart of his being. Now, mm. you had every reason to cry. I don't know how many times you must have cried mm. in prison how many tears you shed mm -hmm. of despair and hopelessness. Um, um, I can't imagine it, because I, mm. I mean, I've never been deprived of my freedom to that extent. But you know, let me just tell you what I'm doing at the moment, is since 1967, in those moments of great despair, I would always find a little bit of paper and I would write it would be a piece of paper of that size, and I'd write almost a book. Now, the, ti the writing was tiny on both sides, and I'd somehow managed to keep it. This is from 1967. Good God. All the way through, till, till you know, I, I, I did the book of prison diaries with Canongate and Stephanie as well. And then, I then, when I was released, I wrote all these, I would write these diaries. Um, for 20, 30 years and one day and I don't know why I did this one day I started to tie them all up and seal them in, in wax and I don't know why I did oh, this wow. so at the moment I've got 21 frames wow. of these all tied up in, in, in frames and it kept troubling me. I thought, 
why am I doing this? And even Kate, my wife, was saying, why are you doing this? You know, and it meant something to me. You know, part of it, as I said, is this because we're living in an age where every everybody tells a story, everybody, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. everything now, and everybody sells it for this, or they go on yeah. reality TV and yeah, yeah, yeah. they all these stupid things. And yeah. was me, it a part? Was it a part of me reacting to this and saying, "I don't want"? And, and so I've sealed them and put them. And I've now got twenty-one diaries, which wow. can go from fourteen months to thirty months, and I've got these. I've managed in my archive, I found all these small, tiny pieces of paper from 1967. And I was put into prison for the life sentence in 1967. Really? So I've got them all, and I've got them there. And then I suddenly realised that was Joseph. Of course, it's a complete... It's a complete... But it took me at least two or three years to understand that. Then I suddenly thought... My God, that is, this is a Boisean, yeah. the continuation yes, it is, of form. Yes. He's speaking through you. And, and it was like, so I've got this, I, I need to show you them. I at can't some wait. Point. They, they are, for me, every time I bring them out, I've got them in my, my studio, and when I put them out, the hairs of the back of my neck stand up. And let me tell you how powerful this is. I'd done each of the diaries, I did the first one, and then the others were lying there, and, and I did the first one and then framed it. And then I started to change the whole way of, of presenting the diaries. And I thought, oh, that's really good, I, I, I like that. Oh, but I've not done that in the first one. So I said, okay, I'll take it out and unseal it, because I do it with the string and then cover them with wax. So that, you know, they're almost like, Sort of embalmed, yeah, body. Covers. And and I says I'll take it out, and I'll do it the way these are, and I couldn't. God. I couldn't open. I couldn't mm. bear to open it up and to do it. It was like it was like oh, but opening a coffin. Yeah, yeah. It was, and that's the power of them. But suddenly, it makes it. This is boys. 